So in the previous lecture, we were looking at Bochner spaces. So Barnack valued LP spaces. We looked at duality properties of the Bochner spaces. Uh, we haven't proven yet that the Bochner spaces are actually dual to each other because that needs assumptions on the Barnack space that we haven't really introduced yet. But what we could say in general is that there's a norming property of these spaces with respect to each other, which says that the, the LP norm of a function f valued in x can be evaluated by duality, meaning that the, the LP norm of f is the supremum over all g in LP prime valued in the dual space of x. And we can normalize these functions. So they've got norm one. By testing by duality, I mean we integrate our function f against the function g with respect to the, to the duality pairing of x and x star. We integrate that. And we can use this to test norms by duality with no assumptions on the Barnack spaces. And this is for all p between one and infinity, including infinity. We know that the dual of L infinity is not going to be L1, but we nevertheless have this norming property, which is pretty good in practice. So where will we go from there? So this lecture, we're gonna talk about, so this lecture, talk about integration and extension of operators. Now I can hear that somebody is not muted. I can hear a bit of keyboarding going on. So can I mute all? Yep. I mean, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question, but I don't want stuff going on in the background of the recording if possible. So integration, this will be the, the Bochner integral and extension of linear operators. So this is taking an operator on scalar valued functions and then defining it on vector valued functions and then formulating the question of whether or not that extension is actually bounded, which is probably the, the main topic of the course in some form. So let's start with the Bochner integral. So what do we need to define a Bochner integral? We need a measure space. the usual notation, S A mu, and a Barnack space, X. Now, what can we integrate? We don't know how to integrate anything yet. In measure theory, the first thing you integrate are simple functions. Same thing here, we're gonna integrate a simple function. For a simple function F, now remember we have this notation sigma for simple functions. Simple functions look like this. They are finite linear combinations of the, the tensor products between characteristic functions of measurable sets and vectors. And we can assume that the sets S and N are disjoint. When is this simple function going to be integrable? You know, the way you usually define an integral is you take the sum of, of measures of the sets on which this simple function is supported then you multiply that by the coefficients. We're gonna need that these sets are measured up, they're measurable. We're gonna need that these sets have finite measure for this integral to make sense. So this F is in L1 with respect to the measure mu. If and only if the measure of Sn is finite for every N. Because otherwise you're going to have this set of infinite measure where the function is constantly some vector X and then that integral is not gonna make sense there. We don't have a notion of an infinite integral for vector valued functions, unlike the scalar valued functions where you can talk about an, an integral of a non-negative function being infinite. We can't do that for Barnack space valued functions because there's no canonical positive infinity when you have two or more dimensions, really. So in this case, in this case where the simple function f is in L1, we define 
the Bockner integral in pretty much the only reasonable way you could think of. So we'll use two notations here, the integral of f d mu or the integral of f s d mu s. And this is defined to be the sum of the measure of the set s n times the vector x n. And this is in x. It's really the only reasonable definition you could make. Just remembering this representation of f here. Now this map that we define that sends a function to its integral is well defined. You should check, but it doesn't take very long to check that. A simple function can have more than one representation. You can decompose the sets into smaller disjoint sets and then you know define the integral with respect to that and you're going to get the same quantity in the end. So this map's well defined and linear. Again, you can check the linearity, not too hard to do. And it maps integrable simple functions. So simple functions intersect L1 into X. Now this space here, the space of integrable simple functions, this is dense in L1. We proved that last week. So what we'd like to do is extend this Bochner integral on simple functions by density to all L1 functions. We have it defined already on a dense subspace. We just need to show that it's continuous in the appropriate norms. So this will extend by density to a map from L1 into X, if it's continuous. Of course, it is continuous. We just haven't proven it yet. Now, the continuity is not particularly hard to show. You have to look at the norm of the Bochner integral of a simple function, the norm in X, of course. And to, to estimate this, we just, we write out the definitions and we use a triangle inequality. There's really nothing too fancy here. So this is the norm of the sum over N, the measure of the set SN, the vector XN, norm of that sum in X. I should have pointed out, this is a finite sum. There are no issues of convergence here. You can always take finite sums in X. We bound this with the triangle inequality. This measures positive, you get the, the norm of Xn. And now these Sn's are disjoint by assumption. So what this sum here is, this sum here is actually the integral over S of the pointwise norm function of F. If you think about that for a moment, you see that that's true. And what we have on the right hand side here is the L1 norm of F. So the Bochner integral is continuous from L1 into X. It's defined on all simple functions, which are dense in L1. So it extends by density to all of L1. So we can use that to define the integrals of every L1 function. And I write down that definition. So for all integrable G, valued in X, we have, or we define the Bochner integral of G to be the limit of Bochner integrals of simple functions Fn, where Fn approximates G in L1 and all of the Fn's are integrable simple functions. I'll just write L1 intersect sigma. Using the density of that space in L1, you can always find such an approximate. And by this standard functional analysis theorem of extending by density, this doesn't depend at all on which approximating sequence you pick. 
Now this limit here, of course, is in X, in the norm on X. And since we can take the Bochner integral of any function in L1, if we call functions G in L1, Bochner integral. Oops, my screen has messed up somehow. Okay. Just as in scalar valued measure theory, we talk about L1 functions as being integrable functions. They're the ones that have integrals. Any questions about that definition? It's all reasonably straightforward. Define on simple functions, extend it by density, whatever. Simple functions are dense in most of the spaces we consider. So we're gonna use this representation of the integral on simple functions quite often, whenever we prove things. Incidentally, it's pretty rare that you actually ever evaluate a Bochner integral explicitly. Like you don't usually write out what that vector is. You just know that it exists and it has a bunch of nice properties because it's an integral. Just like in measure theory, you don't usually evaluate integrals. In calculus, you evaluate integrals, but in the abstract, you usually don't. I have some maybe very pedantic question there. Good. Um, I think, I mean, one might be tempted to make the representation of simple functions unique by asking that the uh, vectors xn are pairwise different. In fact, I believe you did that in one of I did that at some point and I forgot to do it this time. Yeah, you yeah. can make that representation right. unique. So then, then this well definedness that you just mentioned earlier is uh, not The an problem issue. then is when you prove the linearity. Because That's right. when you. The issue moves there. Yeah. You, you just pushing the difficulty from one place to the other. There's always going to be a difficulty somewhere in the world That's of right. fineness. So I just remember free, during yeah. your last lecture, I was spending a long time <laughs> proving yeah. linearity or rather that it's a vector space, right? That, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are yeah. you yet identifying functions that agree up to set of measure zero? Not right now, although I probably should because I've defined it on L1 functions, right? And L1 is almost everywhere equivalent slices of functions. And Which of course, something, some, something I've just, yeah, I've completely swept under the rug because I and like I avoiding you, this. Yeah, I believe so far you haven't actually uh, had a use of it, but yeah. Yeah, if F and G are almost everywhere equal and they're in L1, then of course their integrals are equal. Right, so that would be then the well-defined this. That's the well-definedness on L1. I mean, first what they're well-defined on simple it? functions, which I don't identify for some reason. Then you can show that if a function has measure zero support, then its integral has to be zero. You can see that from the simple function representation. Or also from the fact that the, the norm of a Bochner integral is controlled by the L1 norm of the function. If F is equal to zero almost everywhere, then it's, it is zero in L1. It has zero L1 norm. And so the Bochner integral has zero norm. It has to be the zero vector. In many ways you can deal with as well definedness and almost everywhere equivalence and whichever way you do it, it works. Okay, great. And I think I have exhausted my pedantic questions for yep. now. I mean, my way of approaching this is to ignore it and that also yeah, works. Okay. That's what it, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a little, yeah, pedantic comment. It's a good comment to make. I kind of figured somebody would ask it and then I could explain it as a parenthetical remark instead of, you know, saying it's really part of the lecture. But no, it is a good point. So I have a proposition. We're not going to prove all of it because some of it's pretty tedious. This proposition is basic properties of the Bochner integral. And some of these basic properties are interesting. Like whenever you see a proposition called basic properties of the integral, your brain sort of turns off and you think, yeah, linearity, whatever, dominated convergence, all that stuff. There's a few that are interesting here. I'm gonna prove them one by one as I introduce them. The first one, and this one is actually really important and does not appear in scalar valued integrals, which is nice, is commutation with linear maps. So if you have a Bochner integrable function, I'm not gonna quantify over the measure space or the Banach space, you know what I'm talking about here. 
if you have a Bochner integral function and you have a linear map T from X to another Banach space Y, I should say Y whoa, is another Banach space. T, I write this curly L X Y for bounded linear operators. Then T applied to the Bochner integral of F. So recall this Bochner integral is in X. So T of this vector is defined. You're gonna get a vector in Y. And this is itself a Bochner integral of TF. So this is in Y where the function TF of S is just T of F of S. The pointwise evaluation of the operator T. The only analog that this has for for the vague integrals for scalar valued functions is part of linearity. If you multiply a Bochner integral by a scalar, it's the same as putting the scalar inside the integral. Except here you have more general operations and just scalars. You actually have all bounded linear operators into another Banach space. And this is surprisingly powerful, this little result here. Now I said I'd prove them one by one and this one I'm gonna prove. One question. Yeah. So. Uh, like a part of this statement would be that if f is in R1, then automatically tf is yep. also in R1, right? Yep, yep. Okay, okay. And I'm actually not even going to prove that, but you can prove that by the Petters theorem. All you really need to show is a strong measurability. Once you've got that, the L1 norm control just comes directly from boundedness of t. Yep, you, you get a, a norm of t out the front in the L1 norm, of course. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to skip that kind of issue quite often. Every time I don't prove strong measurability, it's a direct consequence of the Pettis theorem. Check the weak measurability, check the separable validness. Yeah. So the proof of everything but the strong measurability. Uh, if f is a simple function, it suffices to check this on simple functions. So we define f as before. Then you can check that TF is also simple. In fact, you barely need to check this. And it has this form here. This holds point wise. You just apply T to every one of the vectors in the simple representation of F. And when you check what T of the Bochner integral is, this is T of the following sum uh, xn, and then you use linearity of t to put it inside the sum. And this here is the Bochner integral of tf by definition. Easy, barely anything to show there. But as I said, surprisingly powerful. And yeah, it suffices to check this on simple functions by density. Okay, what's the next property? Next is a closure property. Maybe not as powerful or as interesting as a commutation property, but still important. If F is Bochner integral, and if there's a subspace X zero, I should say a closed subspace, such that f of s is in this subspace for almost every s. Then the Bochner integral of f is also in that subspace. That's not a surprise. You think of a Bochner integral as being like a, a sum of things in a certain subspace and that subspace is closed. So it's gonna to have to be in that subspace, right? But how do you prove it? There are a few proofs. I'm gonna give my favorite one. There are direct proofs where you just show that it's a limit, but I like this indirect proof. We'll assume that X zero is a proper subspace of X, otherwise there's nothing to show. And we'll fix a vector Y, which is in X, but not in X zero. And such Y exists because we assume that X zero was not X. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to show that the Bochner integral of f is not equal to y for arbitrary y not in x0. As I said, this is a very indirect proof. By everybody's favorite theorem, Han Banach, as I said, indirect, we choose a functional x star such that, I'll scroll down a little bit, such that x star of y equals one and such that the subspace x zero is contained in the kernel of that functional. So this functional vanishes on this subspace x zero and it equals one on y. And we're gonna test this functional against the Bochner integral. And what happens? We have the commutation property from the previous, well, this previous property that we just proved. Remember, of course, that X star is linear operators from X to the scalar field. In particular, it's a bounded linear operator into a Banach space and we're applying it to a Bochner integral. So we can put it inside the Bochner integral. Like that. And I'm gonna write a, these little S's here. And remember that X zero is contained in the kernel of this functional and that F of S is in X zero for almost all S. So this function that we're integrating is equal to zero for almost every S. So this, this integral here, this is a, a scalar valued Bochner integral. It's a Lebesgue integral. Scalar valued Bochner integrals are Lebesgue integrals. This integral here is zero. So what does this tell you? This tells you that the Bochner integral of f is not equal to y, because if it were equal to y, well, testing y against x star would give you one, but we're getting zero, so it can't be y. So y in x take x zero was arbitrary. So the Bochner integral of f has to be in x zero. <laughs> it's a fun little proof. It's a this is proof by Han Banach, so it makes you think maybe you need some set theoretic assumptions for this to be true. There is a more direct proof, but I prefer this proof. So that's the closure property. Again, it's it's useful, it's sort of innocuous, but it's useful. What's the third useful property we need? Dominated convergence. Not interesting, but useful. Dominated convergence. Let's consider a sequence of functions. Uh, a sequence of integrable functions. We consider a function f mapping into x, but with no further assumptions yet. And we'll assume that the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence fn is equal to f almost everywhere. And yeah, here I'll be careful and say almost everywhere. And we want to know when f is integrable and so on. And when the limit, when the integral of f is the limit of the integrals of fn, this is dominated convergence, right? But where's the domination? We suppose there exists a scalar valued function g. Scalar valued integrable function g, of course, such that the pointwise norm of fn is less than or equal to g almost everywhere. So this is the, the uniform domination of the functions fn that dominated convergence talks about. Under these assumptions, the limit f is integrable. This includes strong measurability, of course. It's integrable. And its integral, as you'd guess, is the limit of the integrals of the approximants. <laughs> 
Okay. I'm not going to prove this yet. Question? I have a question. So yeah. um, can you generalize this to convergence in measure and uniform integrability? Yes, I think so. We're going to talk about uniform integrability later on, actually. Okay. Never but mind. only in one little section. So we're not going to really investigate it fully. But yeah, I'm pretty sure you can say more general things in this. Yeah, okay. okay. We're not going to need them for the purpose of this course. I'd say check the analysis in Barnack Spaces book and you'll probably find the statement you want yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's not one that I've personally used anywhere, so I can't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to prove this, but I'll just give it very quick one line sketch, reduce to the scalar case. Okay, you could have guessed that that might be the case. A little bit of fiddling around, it's in the notes. I think it's a one paragraph proof. And you could probably reconstruct it yourself. The last property that I'll talk about is substitution or as it's more familiarly known, change of variables. And this is another one that I'm not gonna, oh no, I'm gonna prove this one, Never mind. So let's take a measurable space, S prime, A prime, measurable. So no measure on it. We already have our measure space, S A mu lying around. And we consider a measurable function phi from S to S prime. So this is our change of variables, phi. We let new be the push forward measure of mu with respect to phi. If you can't remember what this measure is, it's just take a set, pull it back through phi, look at the measure of that. That's the push forward method. It's sort of, it's a push forward because you're taking a measure on S and pushing it forward to S prime, but you're kind of pulling sets back. Covariant, contravariant, functors, whatever. So you use the push forward measure on S prime. We consider an integrable function G on S prime with respect to the push forward measure. And we look at how the, the integral of G with respect to the push forward relates to the integral of a function on S. So the composition of phi with G is integrable with respect to mu, which includes things like strong measurability. And the integral of this composition, this is D mu is the integral of G with respect to the push forward measure. Classic substitution change of variables in a measure theoretic sense. If you're used to the calculus change of variables, you're gonna have some Jacobian factor lying around. This is part of the push forward measure. It's not written in this form. So I'll give a, maybe not a full proof, but a sketch of the proof. Just to show that this composition is in L1 First, you use Pettis to guarantee the strong measurability. I won't give the details, but that's pretty straightforward. G is strongly measurable, so it's weakly measurable and separably valued. Phi is measurable. You get weak measurability for free. You get separable validness for free. There you go. It's strongly measurable. Check those details yourself or look in the notes. Now, to see that it's actually in L1, you have to just evaluate the norm. But this norm is the Lebesgue integral of a scalar valued function, this pointwise norm. So you can use substitution for scalar valued functions. Let me just write that down. This is scalar valued. So you scalar valued substitution. And this is finite by assumption. G was integrable with respect to nu. So this is the L1 norm of G. So this composition is in L1, so it's Bochner integrals defined. We just don't know what it is yet. Now, how do we check whether two vectors are equal? We test them against functionals. So let's consider all functionals in the dual of X. 
and we test this Bochner integral against the functional. Now, I already gave this argument using the commutation with linear maps that if you take a linear functional applied to a Bochner integral, it's an integral applied to the functional on the inside. And now again, we have, we can use substitution for scalar valid functions because this here is a scalar valid function. And that's what this gives you, just using substitution for scalar valid functions. And then we take the, the application of the functional outside the Bochner integral using the commutation property again. Okay, so what does this tell you? It tells you that this Bochner integral is equal to that Bochner integral because this is true for every linear functional X star. Okay, and that's all. This technique here of getting a, an identity that holds for scalar valid functions and then showing it for vector valid functions by testing against all functionals, this here is called scalarization, actually. For a scalarization technique. I will use that a few times in the course. I'll just say by scalarization, this identity holds. What I mean by that is test against every functional reduced to the scalar valid case. Quite a useful identity to use, useful technique, I should say. So that's the end of that proposition. I have one other little theorem to show, which could really be part of this proposition, the Fabini theorem, which is also proven by reducing down to the scalar case, but you have to state it. If you have two measure spaces, actually I'm calling, yeah, that's what I'm calling them here, S and S prime. Now remember, I'm assuming every measure space is sigma finite. So these are both sigma finite. Fabini's theorem doesn't hold for non-sigma finite spaces, even in the scalar case. So here we definitely need sigma finite measure spaces, but this is okay with us. For a function f, which is integrable on the product space, so s cross s prime, you know, you take the product sigma algebra, the product measure, and so on. Then the integral of f on the product can be written as an, in, an iterated Bochner integral in the familiar way. So you can integrate over S prime, integrate over S, F of S, S prime, D mu S, D mu prime, S prime. Part of the statement of Fabini's theorem is that this integral makes sense and that it gives you a result such that the outer integral also makes sense. And the same is true here, but I'm not writing down all these details. It's written explicitly in the notes and it is tedious to write out. And you can do this iterated integral in either way. So just to reiterate, part of the statement is that these make sense. So you should say something like for all, for almost all S prime, this function F S is Bochner integrable and so on and so forth. Check the notes. The proof is basically it uses Pettis to show the strong measurability. It uses the scalar Fabini theorem. It uses scalarization, like what I showed in the previous proposition. So that's the Fabini theorem. It's not too interesting again, but you know, useful. We've got to set up all these things before we can do something interesting. How much time do I have before the break? Eight minutes. I can do one more thing in that eight minutes. Were there any questions about Fabini or scalarization or these properties of the Bochner integral? All fairly straightforward. Cool. An example of the use of the Bochner integral to define something interesting 
is the Fourier transform. We're not going to really go deep into Fourier analysis yet, but I just want to define the Fourier transform now because I mentioned this in, I think, the first lecture. I was talking about the Plancherel theorem and the fact that it fails and the, the Hilbert transform and the fact that this isn't always bounded and everything is defined in terms of the Fourier transform on Barnack valued functions. And I kept saying in lecture one, we need to define this analog of the Lebesgue integral so we can define the Fourier transform. Well, now we have it. So let's take a Barnack space, which is a, a complex Barnack space. So the scalars are the complex numbers. And let's take a function which is integrable on Rd for some d. You can think d equals one if you like, valued in x. Then we define the Fourier transform. It's written as f hat or curly f of f. It maps Rd into X. Again, this, maybe this is not the most obvious thing. Why should the Fourier transform of an X valued function be an X valued function? It just is. This is just how we define it. It's the most natural thing. We define it in the following way for all frequencies Xi. We think of them as frequencies, of course. F hat of Xi is the integral over Rd with a complex exponential e to the minus two pi i t dot xi times f of t dt. You can put a normalizing factor, something involving two pi out the front if you want. I'm not going to, maybe I should, it doesn't matter. Now this integral here is a Bochner integral. Now does this Bochner integral make sense? Of course it does, but why does it make sense, right? So F is strongly measurable because F is in L1, it's strongly measurable by assumption, right? And the complex exponential, this function mapping T to E to the minus two pi I T dot Xi is measurable and scalar valued. Therefore, by a lemma that we did, I think in the previous lecture, I can't remember, the function mapping t to the product is also strongly measurable. We showed this using the Pettis theorem, but you can also show it directly. So it, it's a candidate for Bochner integrability. We also need to show that this function is actually well, integrable. And that's easy enough to show. So this, what do I wanna show? I wanna show that the L1 norm is finite. It's less than or equal to the integral of this. But of course, these scalars here have modulus one. So they don't affect the norm of FT for each T. These are complex phases here. They're not really exponential. They're oscillating around the unit circle, right? So what you have here is the integral of the norm of F of T DT, which is the L1 norm of F. And in particular, this is finite by assumption. So this integrand here is actually Bochner integrable. So the Bochner integral is well-defined. And this is for all, not just almost all, for all Xi in Rd. And you should then ask, is the Fourier transform actually a strongly measurable function? Because now it's a function of Xi. I've guaranteed that F hat of Xi exists for every Xi, but I haven't shown that F hat is strongly measurable. This is an exercise in the notes, so I'm not gonna prove it. But F hat is actually in L infinity, valid in X. So not only is it bounded, but it's also strongly measurable because strong measurability is actually a prerequisite for 
being in this Bockner space here. You can say more than that. If you read the exercises, you get a little tiny roadmap on how to prove this. We can also define, can define also f hat for functions on the torus, where this torus here is just the unit interval to the power d. Using the standard formula, it's in the notes. You then get that f hat maps zd to x, as always. You can also define inverses, inverse Fourier transforms using the standard formulas. And the inversion theorems sort of hold, but you need to be a bit more careful about which functions you apply them on. Because if you have an L1 function f and you apply the Fourier transform, you get an L infinity function. And the inverse Fourier transform is defined if f is in, well, if that function is in L1, but L infinity functions are not in L1 generally. So you get a problem here. But you can define nice slices of smooth functions like Schwartz functions and so on, such that the Fourier inversion theorem holds. And we'll come to that later on in the course. Here, I just wanted to define the Fourier transform. And it's time for a break, I guess. Any questions before the break? Okay, let's have well, a break. Let's come back and, oh, we have a question. Maybe I've got a dumb one. Uh, yeah, good. My harmonic analysis sucks. Um, so okay. what's the difference between defining the Fourier transform on the torus and um, RD? It's just a periodic thing, right? Because yeah, like, I mean, you can see them as being the same thing, really, if you go yeah, to the theory yeah. of distributions and you look, talk about periodic distributions or whatever. But yeah, the thing is that obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but if you consider a, a function on the torus and you look at its periodic extension on RD, mm. then it's not going to be integrable. Mm. So you, this definition of the Fourier transform on integrable functions doesn't apply to it. You have to take the definition of the Fourier transform on distributions because this periodic extension will be a, a tempered distribution and then use that definition and then notice, oh, hang on, this Fourier transform is actually localized on the integers. It's actually, a, you know, it's a distribution. It's like a, you've got all these Dirac masses at every integer and that gives you the Fourier transform on the, on the integers. Right. That's how you reconcile these definitions. It takes right. a bit of work there. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like yeah. it. <laughs> you do that in a, in a good Fourier analysis course. Yeah. Any others? Okay, we'll do the 15 minute break, come back at 15 past. Have a good break. <laughs> 